back in December, we uh, looked at ten resolutions from Proverbs chapter 3, and I'd like for you to turn there with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Ten resolutions that we found in this chapter that would be real good for God's people to resolve to do. And that's what a resolution is. It's something that you, to God, resolve to do. I don't understand why anyone, especially a Christian, could say, I just don't believe in making resolutions. Apparently, you don't believe the Bible. Because the Bible teaches that we should resolve to do some things. Amen? Amen. And these are some pretty cool things to resolve to do. So what God's led me to do is begin to look at these resolutions one at a time, just a little bit closer. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the first one that was mentioned in verse 1 that says, Don't forget what the Bible teaches. Sometimes we do, do we not? At least we act like we forget what the Bible teaches. We need to remember what the Bible teaches and begin to resolve to do what the Bible teaches as well. Today we're going to look at the second resolution, and that's over in verse 3. And this resolution just simply tells us, don't let mercy and truth leave you. I asked, I asked Linda to sing that song this morning because it goes so well with a message that I believe God wants us to look at today. But notice what verse 3 says there. It says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. That word forsake means to leave you. Don't let mercy and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Let's pray just one more time. Can we do that? Father, I just pray that you would truly, truly speak to the hearts of everyone in this service today, and those that will watch the message later, that we really get this message today. It is so important for us as individuals, and it's so important for how we deal with others as well. We love you. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, I pray. Let me tell you something. That's some pretty strong language right there. Extremely strong language. I mean, God is really telling us something pretty powerful right here. Before we look at mercy, notice the word truth. What is truth? Jesus said, I am truth. Amen? I think John 14, 6. The word is truth, is it not? We believe that it's the truth, is it not? And then Jesus, before he left this world, he said, I will send my spirit. I will send my spirit and he will lead you into all truth. Truth is important. Too many people have left the truth that's taught in God's word. It's important for us as individuals to get back to the truth, to become what God wants us to be so that we can enjoy the life that God wants to give to us. It's important for families to not forsake the truth. It's important for husbands and wives together to be what God wants them to be and observe the truth of God's Word. It's important for, for nations to get back to the truth. Would you agree with that? Would you agree with me that the United States of America is forsaking the truth of God's Word? Oh, how we need to get back to it. And then I think it's important that churches not leave truth as well. And unfortunately, many churches today that call themselves churches, I believe God has rejected because they have rejected the truth. We need to hang on to what God says is the truth. So the resolution here says... Don't let truth leave you. Now let's go over to mercy. Mercy is a very similar word. A, a very, very um, important word, I should say. Now it's very similar to grace. Mercy and grace sometimes look alike, but they are different. Very, very different. Let me give you some examples. In, in Hebrews 4.16... For example, the scripture says, Let us therefore come boldly 
into the throne of grace. Notice what it says, that we may obtain mercy. So we can see here that grace and mercy is similar, but they are different. Let us come, the scripture says here, to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy. God's grace and mercy can be viewed as two sides, actually two sides of the same coin. One side, we have grace. Grace is what God gives us when we do not deserve. Would that be a pretty good definition of grace? Grace gives us what we don't deserve. On the other side of the coin, looking at mercy, mercy does not give us what we deserve. Do you see the difference here? Grace is where God is given. Mercy is where God is withholding. There's some other uh, things that we can look at as well. Mercy is what we receive after we have received God's grace. Isn't that wonderful? Once we have accepted God's grace through faith, we have mercy from God. The Scripture says in John 1.17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ. I'm going to touch more on that in just a few moments, but that is a very important verse of Scripture. Moses gave us the law, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, the law is holy. The law is just. The law is good, according to Romans chapter 7 and verse 12. But what the law does is this, and you have to agree with this. The law actually magnifies our sin. The law actually shows us how far we are from God. When you look, for example, when you look at the Ten Commandments, the Ten Commandments shows us that we are not right. Does it not? When's the last time you looked at them? It shows us that we are not right. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 19, it says, What purpose then does the law serve? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Now notice verse 24 of this verse. Galatians chapter 3, uh, Sherry. Now note, go all the way to verse 24. Notice what it says. Therefore the law was our tutor. That word tutor means schoolmaster. Therefore the law was our tutor, our schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. If there was no law, we would not understand that we have a need of a Savior. Amen? Um, do you begin to maybe understand the reason Satan wanted the Ten Commandments removed from our schools? Do you begin to understand maybe why Satan wanted the Ten Commandments removed from anything and everything? Because the Ten Commandments shows us that we're not right. It points us to Christ. That's what Galatians 3.24 says here. Colossians basically says the same thing as well. In Romans 3.20-24, and I'm not going to read that, but you can read it later if you're making notes. It says very plainly that the law cannot save us. Only Jesus can save us. Amen. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, we see through these, these two verses of Scripture that grace shows us that we need mercy. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. In Titus 3, 5, it says, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to what? Anyone know what that says? According to His mercy, He saved us. Notice this statement on the, on the screen. God gave mercy the moment we accepted His grace through faith. Amen? Amen. We was lost. We was on our way to hell. But God stepped in. Mercy stepped in. Amen? Mercy stepped in and said, we are not guilty. That's so powerful. It is so, so powerful. In Hebrews 4.16, it says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time 
of need. According to the Bible, we all have sinned. Romans uh, 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says that. 1 John 1.8 we see according to this verse of Scripture that we are all guilty. Not a one of us is not guilty. We all have sinned. The, the law that I mentioned earlier shows us that we're all guilty. We all have broke the law of God. And uh, James says if you've just broke just one of them, you're guilty of all, he says. We're all guilty. Now listen to this. And because we are guilty, there is a sentence to be imposed. And the sentence is death. It's hell. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. That's the punishment as a result of of our guilt. But I like the last portion of that verse better than I like the first portion, don't you? The result of sin, the wages of sin, the sentence of sin is death. But the gift of God, that's God's grace, that's God's mercy, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Folk, I can go back to the very day that I truly understood that completely. As a young boy at the age of 16, I finally realized I was guilty. And then I heard that someone had paid my debt completely. Wow. And that if I would accept the payment that he paid for me, for me, that in God's eyes, I would become not guilty. Folks, that's where mercy comes in. That's where mercy comes in. Romans ten thirteen says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Who does that exempt? No one. You may be thinking here today, well, that don't include me. Because you don't understand what I have done. But God does. And when Jesus was on the cross, I like the, the song. I forget who came out with that song many years ago. Um, I don't know if it was Gold City or the Cathedrals. I don't recall now. But it said, um, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. I believe that. So it makes no difference what you have done. Yeah, you're guilty. But through grace, God will be merciful and forgive. And in God's eyes, you're no longer a guilty sinner. You are a saint ready for heaven. Amen. Amen. The mixed up adult looked at, uh, began to look at John chapter 14 this, this morning. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, I will come again so that you can be as well. Not only has he removed the sentence <laughs> of our guilt, of hell that we deserve. He's replaced it with something different. See, I guess God, if, one, if God would have wanted to, He could have made man where He was not immortal, with the exception of being, being lost. And when you're saved, you'd just be, you would escape hell. And when you die, that's it. Bonnie, Bobby is enjoying the best part of his life today. John Uncle Charles is enjoying the best part of his life today if he knew Christ as his Savior. I tell you what, 
if this old boy ever dies, don't you let anybody bring me back to life. Amen? I'm going to come back mad. <laughs> Especially if I was gone very long. I, I just... Not guilty. Because of God's mercy. Because of God's grace. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Proverbs 3, 3 says, Don't let truth and mercy leave you. Sometimes I think we as Christians get so high and mighty, we forget about where we was. Amen? We need to remember where we was. I think that should be the motivating factor of do better and better and better and better. I don't serve God because I'm afraid He's going to cast me out or because He's going to no longer be my father. I serve Him because He is my daddy. And He loves me unconditionally. He loves me for who I am. Now, let's look at another aspect of this altogether for just a moment. I believe too many Christians, Christians, I say, have really departed from truth and mercy in the way that they behave with others. Folk, we have received mercy from God. Should we not give that mercy to others? And I'm not just talking about for salvation. I'm talking about long-suffering and gentleness and forgiveness and an uncondemned spirit. I've heard people say, well, I tell you what, I'll never forgive them. I'm glad God didn't say that to you. Amen? Yeah. I think sometimes we forget how we should treat people. Jesus made it very, very clear that we should treat people the way He treats us. He told His disciples, I'm going to give you a brand new commandment. Don't just love others as you love yourself. He said, no, I want you to love others as I have loved you. Wow. That is so, so powerful. Now, I want to go back to the verse of Scripture in John 1.17. Because there's something I want to talk about very briefly. It says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came. That word came is very important. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I've got a three-minute video that I want you to watch. Pay attention to this video. Jesus was not the balance of grace and truth. Jesus was the embodiment of grace and truth. And, and you know grace and truth. Grace says, don't worry about it, you're okay. Truth says, no, you're broken. Grace says, you know, it's going to work out. Truth says, yeah, but you're going to have to work hard. Grace says, you're forgiven. Truth says, yeah, but you're accountable. Hmm. Grace says, you're okay. Truth says, you're not so okay. See, some of us grew up in truth churches, didn't we? Some of us grew up in grace churches, didn't we? Some of us had truth parents. Some of us had grace parents. If you're lucky, you had one of each. And they argued behind closed doors about how to raise you. And chances are your dad was about truth and your mom was all about grace. Hmm, maybe God did that on purpose. But John said when we watched Jesus, here's what we saw. We saw someone who was full. To the brim of grace and truth. Amen. And at times we would try to play one off from the other. And he wouldn't let us go there. At times we tried to push him into a corner and get him to explain, but there was a tension. 
And John says, as I look back on his life and as I look back on my experience with him, I realize this is a tension I must learn and the church must learn to carry because if you resolve this tension, you lose something. You give up something important. He goes on, he says this. Out of his fullness, out of his fullness, his fullness of grace and truth, out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace already given, or literally in the Greek text it says, we have received grace upon grace, grace upon grace. And then he makes this contrast. For the law, we all know about the law, the Ten Commandments, 600 and something commandments from the Old Testament. For the law, this is important, was given through Moses. Remember he came down, he had the Ten Commandments and there's a whole bunch of other commandments. The law was given through Moses. Moses showed up to the nation of Israel and said, here's the law that you're to live by. Thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou shalt, thou shalt not. And if you break the law, Here's the sacrificial system you have to engage in to make atonement for your sin. The law was given through Moses. And then John pauses. He says, given isn't the right word. Grace and truth came, not given. Grace and truth, the little term there is became. It was begotten. It was born. It showed up. It was already a package. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Christ. And John says to us, and this is different. It's a different kind of way of thinking. It, there's a tension. There was always a tension with Jesus. And to try to resolve that tension is you're either going to lose grace or you're going to lose truth. And if you lose either, you lose something important. Not the balance of, not the balance of, the full measure of. I think we all have seen grace churches and we've all seen truth churches but I want Life Bridge to be a church of grace and truth. Notice the statement on the screen, the next slide. God used the law to show us we were not right. But notice this next statement. God uses grace and mercy to make us right. Is that not cool? Amen. That's exciting. Here at LifeBridge, we practice. We really try hard to practice what we preach. We practice no matter what you have done, we will forgive you. Amen? Amen? Now, why do we practice at LifeBridge, no matter what you have done, no matter what it is, no matter how terrible it is, whatever it is, we will forgive you. Why do we do that? Because that's what Jesus does. Why should, why should a church be any different than Jesus? Don't let mercy and truth leave you as an individual, as a church. Don't let it leave you in your behavior toward others. Stop looking down on people, amen, and give them the same thing that God has given you. And he said, grace and truth came embodied in Jesus Christ. Embodied in Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know exactly how God will speak to you during this message. We're about to have an invitation. But I just have a strong suspicion. Maybe God kind of whooped you across the head and said, hey, you need to listen to this this morning. You need to stop treating people the way you're treating people. You need to start treating people the way Jesus treats you. Amen. Husbands. Wives. Parents. Amen. Don't say amen loud. Children. We need to start treating people 
the way Jesus treats us. I can just see these these teenagers now fixing to use this later on. But daddy? Huh? And I can hear the daddy say, yeah, but dad, God whoops me sometimes too. <laughs> yeah. But none of this is going to work for any of us until we ourselves have accepted grace and truth. If you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you are guilty. And if you leave this world guilty, you will have to spend eternity paying for your sins. And I hate to share this with you, but you'll never get it paid. Throughout eternity. There's some folks that have been in hell for thousands of years because they refuse to accept Jesus as their Savior. There is no second chances in hell. Second chances are here. And if you have never trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're guilty. But my friend, you can become unguilty today in the eyes of God. Let's stand together. Brandon, lead us in an invitation. Father, we love you and we thank you for your love. I thank you for this very simple message. First, I pray for those that have never trusted Jesus. Help them to see, God, that they're walking on a very dangerous ground. And secondly, God, I pray for those of us that have accepted Jesus that sometimes forget how we should behave and how we should treat other people. Father, help us not to leave mercy and truth. Help us to resolve here today and confess to you where we have went wrong and begin to live like you live through Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen.